44. Service and reckoning. Most of us have been warned at one time or another about the barrenness of a busy life. Well intentioned as the admonition may be, busyness does not necessarily produce a barren life, but rather barrenness of life produces busyness. The majority of active members in a sound church today are primarily doers. Their chief concern is to work for the Lord. But service being the emphasis of their life, they are for the most part motivated by self. We all learn sooner or later that the result of every form of self-effort is nothing but a barren waste, a spiritual death valley. Our growth is bound to falter and dry up when service is predominant in the life, especially in the formative years. Conversely, when growth in Christ is given first place, service will never suffer. Furthermore, our life work will be accomplished in his time and his way, and that without physical or mental or spiritual breakdown. The tragedy of the church is that the service-centred believer has little or no concern for spiritual growth other than enough development and training for what he considers to be fruitful service. Naturally altruistic, he is appalled at the thought of placing growth ahead of outreach. The activist rarely seems to become aware of the sin of self or of the necessity of the cross in his life, or of God's purpose in him to be conformed to the image of Christ. There are many believers who feel that the chief problem in our congregations is the existence of an overwhelming number of pew parasites. But on the other hand, the vast army of busy bee workers in our midst constitutes a comparable problem both doing nothing and doing too much, are hindrances to God's purpose. His will for the Christian is expressed in the word being, which in turn will result in effective doing. The reason for this reversal of God's order is plain to see. The emphasis of the average sound ministry is on salvation and service. Get saved and get busy. This makes the new birth everything, and service becomes its byproduct. With this approach, the individual has practically reached his goal at the outset. He is saved. He joins a church. Then he settles down to await his eternal reward. He attends sporadically, but must consistently be attended to. On the other hand, are those who do all the work, having little time or hunger to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, as we read we need to in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Our Father's ultimate purpose in saving us is that we might be conformed to the image of his Son, not simply to keep us out of hell and to get us into heaven. We have been born into Christ that he may be our life, not just our Saviour. In Romans 8, 28 and 29, we read the following. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. When we realise that we have been born into the Lord Jesus so that his life might be made manifest in our mortal flesh, our hungry heart is brought into harmony with that of the Spirit, who has changed us into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Amos 3 verse 3. Our burden for ourselves and others will be the same as the Holy Spirit placed on Paul's heart. 
where in Galatians 4.19 he said the following, My little children, of whom I travail in birth until Christ be formed in you. The emphasis of our life will be growth in Christ. The result of that growth will be fruitful and abiding service for his glory. In our early years, most of us place service far ahead of growth. It is true that there are results of a sort during this period. But the main lesson we learn in all this eager activity is how not to do things. We are quietly being taught and trained by the Spirit through failure. After a time, our soul winning becomes more difficult. There are not many decisions as there once were. And worse still, most of these decisions turn out to be just that. Decisions and nothing more. Our natural reaction is to place the blame on those with whom we deal. But the patient Holy Spirit finally enables us to face up to the fact that we are the hindrance. We are failures after all. We cannot serve acceptably. It is usually this spirit-planned failure in service by which we are brought to realise our need for growth and maturity. Then arises the heart burden to become conformed to his image and to have him do his work through us. The extended Romans 7 failure in this realm also is the Spirit's means of bringing us to the responsibility of reckoning. Instead of struggle and work resulting in failure, the pattern becomes reckon and rest, resulting in growth. Certainly we seek to keep the lost from going to hell by winning them for the Saviour. However, our responsibility in service is not to force decisions, but to allow the Holy Spirit to beget healthy souls through the word and the testimony of our lives. We are to first be witnesses, then soul winners. When the Lord Jesus is reigning and manifest in us, others will hunger for him. Sir, we would see Jesus, we read in John 12, 21. When the Holy Spirit has convicted others of their need for the Saviour, they will freely exercise repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 20, 21. Thus they will not be badgered into a decision to get saved before they are convicted of being lost. Neither will they be coming to him to get, but to give. At his conversion, Paul trembled and astonished and said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Acts 9, 6. This pattern of service is outlined in the word. In Acts 2, 32, Peter said this, This Jesus has God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. The Holy Spirit used witnesses to convict hearts concerning Christ. Now when they had heard this, they were pricked with their heart, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Verse 37. When hearts were convicted of sin through the loving boldness of believers and the witness of the word, they reached out. For then we read in verse 38, Then Peter said to them, Repent. There was no actual soul-winning attempt until Peter's witness had effectively prepared hearts. Then the Lord added to the church daily such as would be saved. Verse 47. When our witnessing and personal work is under the control of the Holy Spirit, the burden and aim of our outreach will be not only that others may be brought to the Lord Jesus, but that they may be built up in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving, Colossians 2 verse 7. 
For one thing, this will eliminate much of the heartache and devastation caused by so many falling by the wayside. When we have in mind the Father's ultimate purpose for each one of us, from the outset of our witnessing, there will be prayerful and careful spirit-motivated preparation of hearts, both before and after conversion. The Lord Jesus is to be manifested in us for effective witnessing. He must be free to minister through us for the fruitful soul winning. Responsible service can be on no lesser basis. Others have every right to witness something of him before deciding about him. Thanks be to God who always leads us in his triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 14. 45. Romans 6 Reckoning. When we first encounter the identification truths, the most serious mistake we can make is to try to reckon ourselves to be dead. Surprising as it may be to some, the word does not teach us that we are to think this. Neither does it teach us that the world, the flesh and the devil are to be reckoned dead. It is quite common for the awakened believer, that is, one who is yearning for the liberation of the cross in his life, to concentrate on reckoning himself to be dead. He is sincere about fully entering into this first aspect of identification, although he is still aware of his old life within. And he feels that if he just reckons on his death in Christ intently enough and consistently enough, he will in time come to the place where there is no longer any response to sin or self. Others press this matter a step further, claiming that self is dead at the very outset of their reckoning it to be so. To uphold this claim, any subsequent manifestation of sin or self in the life is just to them a, well, just a shadow cast by the enemy. They do not consider it to be sin. Also, these uprisings of sin within are considered to be simply old habits seeking to reassert themselves, which they feel will soon be replaced by the development of new and righteous habits. But the desired result cannot follow, as the entire principle is erroneous. Sad to say, the problem of Faulty reckoning in this instance, due to a wrong interpretation, is mainly caused by an inferior translation from the King James. In Romans chapter 6 verse 6, the word destroyed is used in reference to the body of sin, the Lord of sin in our members, that is, thereby causing many to take for granted that self is dead and gone once they begin to reckon it to be so. In the first place, the content of Romans chapter 6 has to do with the tyrannical reign of the principle of sin and not its symptoms, not the symptoms of sin. The problems of sins has been dealt with at the very source by the crucifixion of the cross. The King James's version of the word destroyed in verse 6 is far too strong for that particular Greek word. In the Greek, it has reference to enslaving power, setting forth the fact that the old man has not been annihilated but crucified. Its power has been annulled, has been put down or made without effect. This same Greek word, katageo, is used in Hebrews 2.14, where the cross of the Lord is said to have destroyed the devil. Rather, it is that it broke the power of the enemy. He certainly was not annihilated. In Romans 3 verse 3, this word is translated 
made without effect. In 331, we read that it is made void. In chapter 7, verse 2, the word used is loosed. And in 7, verse 6, the word is delivered. Self has been crucified at Calvary so that it may be rendered powerless to enslave us, made without effect so that we may be delivered from the reign and tyranny of the indwelling principle of sin, that henceforth we should not have to serve sin. The King James Version has a tendency to lead one astray in the area of reckoning because of its failure to set forth our death with Christ in the past tense. In this version, the present tense is used in connection with these truths. Concerning self, our old man is crucified with him. And concerning the believer, he that is dead is free from sin. And if we be dead with Christ, those were from Romans chapter 6, verses 6 to 8. The New American Standard Bible, which is more accurate for study purposes, gives us the contrasting correction. In Romans 6, verse 6, this is how it reads. Our old self was crucified with him. Verse 7 says, He who has died is free or released from the tyranny of sin. And in verse 8, we read that if we had died with Christ. Thus, the New American Standard Version makes it possible for us to reckon aright. In both versions, Romans 6.11 calls us to reckon ourselves dead unto sin, but alive unto God. The NASB enables us to see and understand that we have died to sin, but are now alive in Christ. We are not dead, but very much alive as new creations. The usual mistake made in reckoning is to stop at the wrong point. The purpose of reckoning is that we may abide in Christ who is our life. The first half, dead unto sin, is but the stepping stone into the land. If we stop short there, we are stranded in midstream. True reckoning is to step out firmly, but then to keep on going. We have died to the old Adamic source, but have been resurrected and are now alive in the new source. Death was the means, but life is the goal. Although we are not to halt at the first half of our reckoning, neither are we in any way to regard that step as a superficial one. There can be no effective reckoning in our life in Christ until we are firmly established in the truth of our having died to the old. The steps to maturity cannot be skipped over. Spiritual growth comes by walking in the Spirit, and the Holy Spirit establishes us in each successive realm in preparation for the next. We cannot rest in our risen Lord until we know we have been positionally released from Adam through death. Neither can we rest in the process of being experientially released from the domination of the Adamic life until we know and count on the fact that we are already loosed positionally. True reckoning has its ultimate emphasis on the life side of the cross. We count on having died to sin in order to count on being alive to God. Since we are new creations in Christ, death is forever past. We are brought out of it in him at his resurrection. As for the old man within, we continually reckon that source to have been crucified, so that it may be held daily in the place of death. We reckon the cross crucifies. Look 
carefully at Colossians chapter 3 verse 3 where we read For ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. However we are not dead but alive. Neither is self dead but judicially crucified. We have forever passed beyond death. The NASB version brings out the past tense, for you have died, and your life is hid with Christ in God. All the difference in the world. Once we see that our death to sin is in the past tense, is completed, we are free to count ourselves alive to God in Christ Jesus, and to live, to live in the present tense. The principle of life out of death is pictured both in our public baptism and in the Lord's Supper. Actually, water baptism is to be a testimony of our reckoning. We count ourselves to have been baptised into the Lord Jesus by the Spirit, to have been placed in union with the Lord Jesus by the Spirit, and therefore we died to sin with him, were buried with him and arose in him. Romans 6 verses 3 and 4. The testimony of this reckoning is carried out in pictorial form by our being baptised or placed in water, which covers us in burial from which we arise to walk in newness of life. We are confessing that we died and were buried as far as the old source of life is concerned, and are now risen as new creations to walk in the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Water baptism, therefore, holds less than its full meaning to the believer until he apprehends the identification truths. Water baptism testifies to our new position, that we have died to the old life and are alive to the new. The Lord's Supper sets forth our experience or our condition. We are being conformed to his death so that his life may be manifested. We do not leave the influence of the cross to live, but we continually receive the benefits of its emancipation for our walk in newness of life. To what are we testifying in receiving and assimilating the broken bread and the fruit of the vine? Well, in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 26, we are told this. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show forth the Lord's death till he come. The testimony of our baptism is a once for all picture of our reckoning on our finished work and represents our position. The Lord's Supper is a continuous picture of our being conformed to his death and has to do with our condition. We confess that we are continually participating in his death via reckoning that his resurrection life may be increasingly manifested in and through our mortal bodies. 46. Romans 7. Reckoning If believers knew more fully the deliverance of the first part of Romans 7, they would experience less of the defeat of the latter part. This vitally important chapter has to do mainly with the principle of law. Positionally, in Christ, no believer is under law. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ, John 1, 17. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth, Romans 10, verse 4. Conditionally, almost all believers are to some extent under the principle of the law as a rule of life. The all too general attitude is, I must love the Lord and others. 
I must maintain my testimony. I must witness and work for him. I must resist self. I must stop this sinning. The feeling of constraint expressed in the I must makes for Romans 7 defeat. Romans 7 verse 11 says this, The Lord is holy, just and good. The purpose of God's law, both in command and in principle, is to bring to light and cause us to face up to the fact of our sinfulness, our weakness, our bondage. Its faithful ministry, negative though it may be, is all important. Law does not make us sinners. The Lord is holy, but it reveals to us that we are sinful. By the law is the knowledge of sin, Romans 3 verse 20. Anything we seek to do or keep from doing in our own strength brings us under legal bondage. Any promises or vows we make to the Lord, any codes of ethics or rules of conduct that we set up for ourselves or have placed on us are on the basis of law and therefore result in failure and ever deepening enslavement. The principle of law applies to the self-life and can produce nothing but self-righteousness. Thus the law convicts of our need of life in Christ. The years of struggle and failure we experience are not only to prepare us for the liberation from the tyranny of the principle of sin, but from the bondage of the principle of law. We are brought not only to the release of Romans 6, but to the deliverance of Romans 7. We exchange the law of sin and death for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, Romans 8 verse 2. We are given the key to the problem of law at the very door of Romans 7. Verse 1 says, Know ye not, brethren, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth? Exactly. All through the years of defeat, we have been slowly learning that the harder we tried to live the Christian life, the deeper we came under the dominion of the law of sin. We tried to be, and we tried to do. And there was nothing but failure year in and year out. For when we were in the flesh, the motion of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruits or works unto death. Romans 7 verse 5. As long as we depended on our own resources, all we produced was sin. We hungered for life but brought forth death. But in the midst of our wretched attempts to be delivered from the body of death, this body of death mentioned in Romans 24, in the midst of our wretched attempts to be delivered from the body of this death, our faithful father was teaching us what we had to know for the freedom in Christ. Self is our greatest enemy and Christ is our only hope. For me to live is Christ. Philippians 1.21 With Paul, we came to recognise an internal law. When we would do good, evil was present with us. That is, we saw another law in our members, warring against the law of our mind and bringing us into captivity to the law of sin, which is in our members. Romans 7, 21 and 23. All this has been specifically designed by the Spirit to bring us finally to the blessed condition of defeat where we cry from the heart, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Romans 7, verse 24. Victory is found only through our realisation of defeat. 
I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 7, 25. First, we learn that our having died in Christ on the cross gives us grounds for freedom from the power of sin. But unless we learn the answer to the bondage of the principle of the law, we'll be right back under the defeat of Romans 7, no matter how hard we reckon. Law reveals sin, and law produces bondage. The answer to the principle of sin prepares us for the answer to the principle of law. Reckoning is the key to both, and both have to do with the death of the cross and our life in Christ. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of the spirit and not in oldness of the letter. Romans 7 verse 6. As Paul tells us in verse 1, as long as we lived and walked in the self-life, we were under the principle and the dominion of law. But thanks be to God, we not only died to the principle of sin in Christ on the cross, but there we also died to, or came out of the dominion of, the principle of law. Further, we were not only thereby freed from the oldness of the letter, but were joined to him in newness of spirit. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we might bear fruit for God. Romans 7 verse 4. Here again, we must be reminded that the power for deliverance from the law doesn't reside in the fact that we have died to it, but in our relationship to the risen liberator, Christ, the power of God. 1 Corinthians 1, 24. Unless we clearly reckon on our having died to the principle of law, we are constantly under the pall of failing, failing to meet our spiritual obligations. On the other hand, when we rest in our risen Lord, we are more aware of his sufficiency than we are of the claims of the law on us. And we are able to walk in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. Galatians 5 verse 1. Come unto me, all ye that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Each of us has died to the law, Galatians 2.19. We were discharged from the law, Romans 7 verse 6. And we are now not under the law, Romans 6 verse 14. We are completely out of the realm of the principle and the command of the law and are forever on the ground of grace in our Lord Jesus Christ. The law came in that the transgression might increase. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 5, verses 20 and 21. The spirit of truth is not only explicit and thorough, in presenting the truth, but he is also exact and painstaking in preparing our hungry hearts for the appropriation of it. Most of his spiritual work he accomplishes in our lives through natural means, such as our careful, dependent study, coupled with all the changes of everyday life. The bondage of the principle of law finally brings us to its goal. That is, the death of the cross. Now we are able to understand that through the law I died to the law, that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I or self who live, but Christ, my new life. Christ lives in me, in me, the new creation. And the life which I now live in the flesh, in the body, 
I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. Galatians 2, 19 and 20. As we reckon on having died to the principle of law and abide in our risen Lord, the Holy Ghost progressively carries out the will of the Father in our lives. His perfect will becomes a delight to us and not a duty. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering he for sin condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Romans 8, verses 3 and 4. Not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. Hebrews 7, verse 16. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Galatians 5, verse 1. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Romans 8 verse 2. Consider yourselves to be dead to sin and law, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Romans 6 verse 11. 47. Romans 8 Reckoning. There is a spirit fostered hunger and longing in the heart of every growing Christian for the heaven on earth walk of Romans 8. The very purpose of reckoning is that we may live in this wonderful and practical realm of life in Christ. All that the Holy Spirit teaches us in Romans 6 and then takes us through in Romans 7 combines to prepare us for the walk of Romans chapter 8. This in turn brings us on to the blessed heights of Ephesians and Colossians. Through the years, whether we realise it or not, the Holy Spirit is developing us from glory to glory, 2 Corinthians 3.18, and he's doing this along his prescribed path. Romans 6 is the step that deals with the principle of sin and is the answer to the power, the power of sin. Romans 7 is the struggle, and it's usually years in duration. It's the struggle that has to do with the principle of law that brings the answer to its bondage. And then Romans 8. Romans 8 is the walk, the walk based on the principle of life in Christ, as ministered by the Spirit of life. In studying some of the truths of this heart-satisfying eighth chapter of Romans, we must once again give special attention to the first verse. This is another instance where the King James Version might lead us into bondage, unless we study it with care. In verse 1 we read, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. This text is actually stating that there is no condemnation for us if we walk not after the flesh, and if we walk after the Spirit. Thus, our eternal safety would depend upon our present walk. Oh, but, but that's law rather than grace. We can praise the Lord that the entire New Testament teaches differently. That we escape condemnation through our eternal position in Christ, not our present condition in ourselves. Once more we apply to the corrected New American Standard Bible and it reads like this. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We are free solely because of our redemption and position in Christ 
apart from conditions. The remainder of the King James Version's verse, the conditions, belongs in verse 4 of this chapter and has to do with something else as we will see later. Now notice how correctly and powerfully the truth is now revealed as these first two verses fit together without the erroneous interpolation. Romans 8 chapters 1 and 2 read like this. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. There is actually a dual application in the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Concerning the future, the law of the spirit of life in Christ has freed us from the eternal condemnation of the law of sin and death. As to the present, the Holy Spirit ministers the life of the Lord Jesus within our daily walk progressively freeing us from the power of sin and the deathly influence that it spawns. In Romans 5 verse 10 we read the following. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, it is much more certain now that we are reconciled that we should be saved, that is, daily delivered from sin's dominion, saved through his resurrection life. We are saved from condemnation of sin because of his reconciliation. We are delivered from the power of sin because of his life. Especially in our early years as believers, most of us have felt that it was our responsibility, with the Lord's help, to live the Christian life. Our unqualified failure in attempting to do so has been the Holy Spirit's means of showing us that we cannot produce, nor are we meant to. Only the Lord Jesus can live his life through us. And he does this as we reject our own resources to walk in reliance upon the spirit of life. Romans 8 verse 4 says this, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. This is the addition that we noted in verse 1 of the King James Version. It belongs here as verse 4, not having to do with our redemption or condemnation, but to do with our walk and our growth. What it takes years for us to learn thoroughly is that the Holy Spirit ministers all. By the Spirit we are sealed, Ephesians 1.13. By the Spirit we live, Romans 8.10. By the Spirit we grow, 2 Corinthians 3.8. And by the Spirit we shall be raised, Romans 8.11. It is especially important for us that he is the spirit of life. Even though we are alive in Christ Jesus, we have no power by which to live the new life. For that, as well as for everything else, we must rely on the Holy Spirit. And incidentally, he should not be referred to as the Holy Ghost. Too many Christians today are seeking to live for the Lord on the basis of the principle of love. Their thinking is this, Oh, he loved me and gave himself for me. Therefore, the least I can do is love him and give myself to him. Such a motive is good, it's high, it's altruistic. But it is neither the best nor the highest, nor is it spiritual. Our love is far too weak and vacillating for such an undertaking. Self will see to that. For to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good I find not. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin. Romans chapter 7, verses 18, 22 and 23. 
There is one true and adequate motivating power for living the Christian life. And that is the very life of the Lord Jesus, ministered within by the spirit of life himself. This is not a motivation of love, but the empowerment of life. For me to live is Christ, Philippians 1.21. It is not only what is done for Christ will last, but rather only what is done by Christ that will last. In Romans 8 verse 6, we must again take a close look at the King James Version. We read, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. This particular translation runs counter to the actual teaching of the word. For the believer to be carnally minded does not bring death, as all believers pass through a great deal of carnality as part of their growth. To be spiritually minded does not bring life, as all believers are alive in Christ. Now once more, the New American Standard Bible states the truth accurately. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace, Romans 8 verse 6. Here the word is stating that the makeup, the, the bent, the life of the flesh, is nothing but death whereas that of the Spirit is life and peace, the life of Christ and the peace of God. Verse 7 further reveals the nature of the flesh, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile towards God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. The flesh in its entirety all of self, is dead set against God and everything spiritual. Romans 7.18 says, In my flesh dwelleth no good thing. The flesh is at absolute enmity with God and can neither be reconciled nor can it be redeemed. It took the death of the Son and our newly created life in him to bring us to God. Our old source was not changed, but crucified. It was exchanged for the new creation in Christ Jesus. For they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Romans 8 verse 8. We exchanged the position of death for the position of life. By means of our identification in the Lord Jesus on the cross, we were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, that is Adam, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, Christ. Romans 11.24 How glorious to be a newly created branch, grafted into the true vine. As the life of the vine flows by the spirit of life, the fruit of the Spirit is increasingly manifested in the branch. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. In the vine we are complete. In ourselves we are being completed through the growth based on reckoning. We are gradually being conformed into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 8 verse 29.